Justin Brierly, host and creator of the Unbelievable podcast and YouTube channel, has a video called Why, After 10 Years of Talking with Atheists, I'm Still a Christian. As an atheist myself, I have some concerns about Justin's arguments and about his listening skills. Justin Brierly is still a Christian because he thinks Christianity is the best explanation for three things. Human existence, human value, and human purpose. We've already addressed human existence and human value, so now let's address Justin's final argument, human purpose. Third piece of evidence that I'm going to bring this morning. I believe that God makes sense of human purpose. When it comes to human purpose and how this is meant to prove the existence of God, Justin presents two main arguments. His first argument is that purpose cannot exist if there are no gods. And his second argument is that because we have a desire for some kind of greater purpose, which he conflates with Christianity, a greater purpose probably exists and Christianity is probably true. I apologize if it sounds like I'm poisoning the well here, but this literally is the argument he ultimately makes. So let's talk about Justin's first argument, the idea that purpose cannot exist if no gods exist. This argument appears to be intended as the first premise of a modus tollens argument, which goes on to say that purpose does exist, therefore God exists. Without God, Justin argues, there cannot be purpose, but there is purpose, therefore there is God. If there's no God, if atheism is true, then all of our human endeavors, all of our self-made human purposes, they're one day going to be gone and forgotten in a, in a trillion or so years when all that's left is, you know, a, a vast cosmic expanse of nothing because that's the story, actually, if the universe just peters out, that's what will happen to everything. There's no purpose. There's no meaning. But I see a very different universe to Richard Dawkins. I don't know about you, but when I look around, I don't just see physical processes and natural laws. I see love. I see truth. I see beauty. I see hope. I see good and I see evil. I see a universe that is teeming with purpose and meaning. And I don't think atheism can account for that. The argument that purpose cannot exist if there is no God is an argument that we've heard many times before, and I think the best response is basically just to say, no, purpose absolutely can exist if there are no gods. But we need to be clear what we mean by purpose. I would say that purpose is not an inherent property which things can objectively have on Christianity or on naturalism. Rather, I think this word simply describes how subjects regard objects or other subjects. A thing does not have purpose until a subject wants it for a particular use. A rock, for example, has no purpose until I, a subject, decide to use it as a doorstop. It now has the purpose of holding the door. In this sense of the word purpose, which I think is the most plausible definition that most people use, human purpose absolutely can exist without any gods. We are the subjects. We choose what our purpose is. We decide what to use our lives for. If subjects exist, then purpose can exist. Now, interestingly enough, Justin Brierly does briefly acknowledge that purpose can exist even if there's no God, but he does so in a very sneaky, dismissive way. If there's no God, if atheism is true, then all of our human endeavors, all of our self-made human purposes, they're one day going to be gone and forgotten in a, in a trillion or so years. Did you catch that? Justin briefly acknowledged that self-made purpose can at least exist if there is no God, all of our self-made human purposes. However, in the very next sentence, he said that there is no purpose and no meaning if there is no God. There's no purpose. There's no meaning. So which is it, Justin? In what possible sense is our self-made purpose not really purpose? From the brief elaboration Justin provides in his book, what I think he means is there is no true purpose without God. Yeah, self-made purpose can technically exist if there's no God, 
but it's just your subjective opinion, and it doesn't have any infinite or permanent consequences, and you might be mistaken about what will fulfill you, so that means it's not true purpose. These are all very common apologist complaints about purpose without God, so let's address them in that order. First, to the idea that self-made purpose is subjective, yeah, what else could it be? As I've explained, I don't think that purpose is something which can exist independent of minds. For something to matter, for something to have purpose, it necessarily requires the existence of subjects, which means that purpose will always be subjective. Even if God exists, God is a subject. So even if he has a purpose for you, that purpose is still subjective. Now, perhaps it makes you feel good to think that a really smart and loving creator has a purpose for you, instead of having to come up with one on your own, but neither purpose is more real than the other. Second, to the idea that self-made purpose is temporary, again, yeah, we won't live forever, and our actions won't affect the heat death of the universe, but so what? How is that relevant to the definition of purpose I've outlined and which I think most people would use? How does the temporary status of purpose somehow undermine its very existence? Like every other apologist who makes this argument, Justin Brierley never actually explains how the fact that purpose will not exist in the future, where there will be no subjects, entails that purpose cannot exist in the present, where there are subjects. Why does the impossibility of purpose in the future entail that purpose cannot exist in the present? The apologist never actually defends this assertion, and Justin Brierley is no exception. Incidentally, a very similar argument is sometimes made that if there's no afterlife, and if the heat death of the universe is inevitable, then our actions don't matter in some sense, because it'll all end up the same. If there is no immortality, then life is without ultimate meaning, value, or purpose. It is without meaning because without immortality, it literally does not matter how you live. Everything will wind up the same. But by this logic, you could argue that if I build a house to live in, knowing that it will eventually get torn down like all houses eventually do, then it doesn't really matter how well or poorly I build it, because it all ends up the same in the end, and you know what, I might as well just live in a pile of trash. Does that sound reasonable? No, because even if the final result is ultimately the same, it still matters to us how we get there. Meaning and purpose and things that matter absolutely can exist, even if we do not change some ultimate state of affairs. Things still matter to us today. And finally, to the idea that self-made purpose is fallible in the sense that we could be mistaken about what will most fulfill us, well, once again, yeah, but how is that relevant? A lot of things that we choose for ourselves might be mistakes, big mistakes, but we don't therefore conclude that we need a god of house buying, a god of romantic matchmaking, or a god of professional career development, do we? And once again, how does this actually undermine the definition of purpose I've outlined? I don't think it does. You might be mistaken about the best purpose for anything, including your own life, but that doesn't mean it's not purpose. So as I've now explained, Justin's concerns about self-made purpose are completely correct, but completely irrelevant. They don't actually undermine the existence of purpose in a world where no gods exist. Even if our self-made purpose is subjective, temporary, and fallible, it absolutely still exists, and nothing Justin has said undermines this. Purpose is completely possible without a god. Unfortunately, I don't think that anything I've said will be very convincing to Christians like Justin, because I think what Justin is really trying to say is that without some kind of cosmic foundation, permanent impact, and a salesman's guarantee of maximum fulfillment, 
our self-made purpose just doesn't feel right in his heart. Yeah, you can technically have purpose if there's no God, but I don't like that definition of purpose. I don't like the idea that purpose is not somehow foundational to our very existence. So therefore, it's not true purpose. Feels equal reals. I realize it sounds like I'm simply mocking Justin at this point, but this is actually Justin's second argument about purpose. Christianity is true because we want it to be true. Because we have a transcendent desire for it to be true. Or at least for something like it to be true. As uncharitable as it sounds, feels do equal reals on Justin's view. So first, what are the feels? Well, in his talk and in his book, Justin tells the story of a particular atheist who, after the birth of her first child, decided that there must be something deeper about her love for her new baby. She says, I looked down and thought, what is this baby? And I thought, well, from a purely atheist materialist perspective, he's a randomly evolved collection of chemical reactions. And I realized, well, if that's true, then all the love that I feel for him is nothing more than chemical reactions in my brain. And I looked down at him and I thought, that's not true. That's not the truth. And that moment was a turning point for Jennifer, and it led her on a journey that ultimately ended in Jesus Christ. So now that Justin has the feels, how does he argue for the reals? What is Justin's explanation for the human desire for purpose, which proves that Christianity is true? You see, we all experience this deep down longing for something more, don't we? Sometimes called the argument from transcendence. There's a great quote by C.S. Lewis, who's one of my favorite Christian thinkers, and he says this, a baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. People feel sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. How is that the most probable explanation? That's a huge ad hoc postulate, an entire alternate dimension, which is invoked simply to explain one subset of our emotional experience. That is, as William Lane Craig might say, a massive ontological price tag for your worldview. And there's another problem, which is that no matter what our desires might be, you could just invent any alternate dimension to explain them. You could explain any human desire this way. It is completely ad hoc. This is not a good explanation of the human desire for purpose. In fact, it's probably the single worst explanation of the human desire for purpose I've ever heard. Could that desire that spans all times, places, and cultures, that desire for something more, for meaning, for purpose, could it be that it has a real object which satisfies it? Well, I guess anything's possible, but have you ever considered that maybe people just have unrealistic desires? Maybe we want more than we have, or more than we can have, either because it's an evolved survival instinct to keep us from doing nothing all day, or because our imaginations simply run away with us. Those are both much simpler explanations, and they don't invoke the massive novel postulate of some other world. In fact, I think it's very clear that people can and do have unrealistic desires, which we agree have no real-world referent. These desires can be unrealistic in their degree, or even in their very nature. For example, people have a desire not simply for sex and romance, but for what many of us call a soulmate, another human being who understands us and loves us to our core. Conveniently, of our preferred sex, who just so happens to live nearby and speak our language. And yet, there's no good evidence that these kinds of soulmates actually exist. Does this mean that there must be some other world where we'll all find our soulmates? Probably not. I think it's clear that this is a desire which comes from mental exaggeration, not from a real-world referent. And that's just exaggeration. People can also have desires that are completely impossible. I myself have had a handful of dreams where I could fly like Superman, 
and they were profoundly enjoyable, and I'm sure that many people have a desire to fly like Superman. And yet, humans can't fly like Superman. Does this mean that we were created for a world where humans can fly like Superman? Does this mean that Krypton or Neverland actually exist? No, of course not. People's unrealistic desires do not prove that there is a real-world referent that lives up to those desires. That being said, I think we can actually take C.S. Lewis's argument on board to a large extent, and it still wouldn't prove that God or heaven exists. This is because our desire for purpose does have real-world reference. When we talk about our desire for purpose, it seems to me that we are most plausibly talking about our desire to feel like we've achieved something concrete and that we've made a difference in other people's lives. And guess what? The real world does have opportunities to do these things. You can climb a mountain that no one else has managed to climb. You can help a person who everyone else has chosen to ignore. And you can create loving relationships with the people you care about. Our desire for purpose does correspond to things which exist in the real world. But if you want the fulfillment of this desire to be infinite in both duration and magnitude, well, I would say that that's just another example of exaggeration and imagination, like finding your soulmate or wanting to fly like Superman. Frankly, this is the kind of unrealistic desire that I would expect most people to grow out of by the time they reach adulthood, but which Justin Brierley and C.S. Lewis don't seem to have done. They want infinite fulfillment that lasts forever. Imagine applying this kind of thinking to any other situation. Imagine if architects and civil engineers all started quitting their jobs because my buildings won't last forever, so what's even the point? Imagine if I stopped filling up my car with gas because it's just one car, it doesn't really change the world if I fill it up or not. Does that sound like a reasonable line of thinking? No, it sounds depressed and childish. I'm sorry to put it that way, but this is how Justin Brierley sounds as he, well, whines about the idea that humans will one day cease to exist and that all of our purpose will cease to exist along with us. I'm sorry you feel that way, Justin, but your unrealistic expectations do not prove that there must be something out there which satisfies them. Your desire for some kind of super purpose is no more evidence that God exists than people's desire for a soulmate is evidence that a perfect partner exists. Reality is often disappointing. Deal with it. So now, after explaining how atheism is just so horribly depressing, Justin is going to whip out the miracle product that'll cure what ails ya. I won't tell you what it is, but it rhymes with sneezes. I love the fact that when we sang that song a hundred billion times, it talked about the glory of the universe and this God who created a hundred billion stars and galaxies and they're all singing his praise and we're just joining in the praise of the whole universe. That's a story that's worth living for. That's a story I want to be part of. That's a story with purpose and meaning and hope in it. And the reason it is, is because at the center of it, there's a person called Jesus Christ. This is a classic apologist tactic that I hoped was beneath someone like Justin Brierley. Assert that atheism is depressing, but Christianity is happy. Yay! But the thing is, Justin, two can play at this game. If Christianity is true, then you're just a disposable toy which only exists for someone else's amusement. You're just a cheap commodity manufactured by a being who thought it would be fun to invent ghosts and then cram those ghosts into meat suits with pain receptors and then put those meat ghosts in supernatural danger so that he could rescue a small fraction of them if they say they love him, leaving the rest to be tortured forever after their meat suits stop working. That is horrific, Justin. That is not a story that I want to be a part of. The Christian story is what you would get if the Saw movies had a baby with North Korea. Do you see how easy it is to cast someone else's worldview as depressing and horrible? Do you see how unconvinced you are by this description, Justin? You can make anyone's worldview seem depressing and horrible, but that by itself does not disprove said worldview. Feels don't equal reals. There are two things we can't live without. 
love and hope. If you starve someone of love, if you take away hope, that person doesn't have a reason to live anymore. Then I have good news. The feeling of love and the experience of hope can both exist even if you're an atheist. You can love the people in your life, you can hope for their well-being, and you can hope for a more pleasant future in general. I mean, hell, Star Trek was all about hoping for a better future, and it was created by the staunch atheist Gene Roddenberry. Star Trek was his vision for a better future, a future where we don't have to distrust each other, where we have the resources to eliminate poverty, to cure terrible diseases, and to give everyone the freedom to develop their passions and push the boundaries of who they are to become the people they want to be, no matter how they were born. That is a story worth living for. That is a story I want to be a part of. That is a story with purpose and meaning and hope. Justin Brierley's accusation that atheism robs people of purpose and that taking away someone's belief in God is tantamount to taking away their hope is exactly the kind of emotional, knee-jerk response that I hear from Christians who never even met an atheist before they met me. It is not the kind of response that I would expect to hear from someone who has been talking with atheists for 10 years. Alright, so let's hear Justin's summary of his talk and why, after 10 years of talking with atheists, he is still a Christian. They're on a journey for truth as well. We're all on that journey. But we do have some significant differences in how we view our story. You see, I find it very hard to believe that the rational and ordered universe we live in came from nowhere and is heading nowhere. Well, it's good that you find that hard to believe, because I can all but guarantee that no atheist you've ever spoken to thinks that the universe came from literally nowhere. I find it impossible to conceive that our intrinsic beliefs about human value and dignity are in the end just an illusion. I'm sorry you feel that way, but as I showed in part three of this series, the evolutionary explanation for these intuitions is much better than the explanation that God just made us that way which could explain literally anything. And I can't convince myself that this search for purpose and meaning that we witness in all times and places is ultimately in vain. The search is not in vain, Justin. It simply does not end with the type of infinity answer that you seem to want. Frankly, if you can't get enough purpose and meaning from the people around you and from the things you've chosen to do with your life, then you might have a problem. If you feel unfulfilled by the people in your life and the things you've achieved, that's not a problem with the universe. That's a problem with you. And that's the end of Justin's talk. The rest is just preaching and promoting his new book. These are the three top-shelf reasons why Justin Brierley is still a Christian, none of which indicate that he has spent any time talking with atheists, much less ten years. For a man who proudly proclaims that he's spent 10 years talking with atheists, Justin Brierley doesn't seem very bothered by his profound lack of listening skills. Frankly, if you told me that Justin Brierley had only started talking with atheists one year ago, I wouldn't find the idea all that unbelievable. This video series has been a response to Justin Brierley, but I endeavored to keep the scope broad so that you can share it anytime someone brings up the idea of inference to the best explanation, human existence, human feelings of value, or the human desire for purpose. Thank you as always for watching, subscribe for more, and consider supporting this channel on Patreon for exclusive content and insight into future content.